Good morning or good afternoon. Thanks for joining the uh, CPRN investigator call to cover our governance or our standard operating procedures. Um, just a couple comments about these before we get going. Uh, so we are, you know, in startup mode. So we've been running without formal governance. Uh, governance becomes more important as we receive uh, funds from external um, funding agencies. But it's also intended to give you a very clear and transparent picture of how we're functioning and how decisions are made. Uh, these uh, standard operating procedures are. Uh, put together by the executive committee uh, from a number and, and others, a uh, number of people have contributed to this. Um, uh, and they have been largely assembled from one of two sources, either the Hydrocephalus Clinical Research Network, HCRN, uh, SOPs, which is smaller and single uh, discipline focused on neurosurgery, um, and different because it's focused on it has a base level of funding every year that covers the ability to conduct multiple simultaneous studies, uh, whereas we are more focused on uh, using our infrastructure to go and get uh, publicly funded studies uh, or external funding for studies. And that's much more like the model of the Pediatric Emergency uh, Care Network or PCARN and many of the governance uh, details are taken from there and then all just sort of converted to work with the direction that we are going. So let's dive in. The, our objectives are to get your feedback on the key constructs of our governance, make sure you understand what they are. And really, as we talk about the committees, uh, there's a set of standing committees uh, that do a much of the work of uh, the network, we want, I want to get you thinking about how, where you could best plug in, how you could contribute in that regard. And then lastly, uh, we probably won't get to it today, but we will get to it. Ultimately, we have a, um, we define our research protocol concept and development, and that's really the core workhorse of these SOPs and of CPRM, which is to conduct research and quality improvement, uh, 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 studies. And so uh, I'm hoping that you'll get these benefits from this. Okay, so network development, I hope I said this in the mail that I sent out that I didn't really think that you need to spend much time on this. This really recaptures what was in our strategic plan that was set in March 2016 and shared with the investigator committee some number of months thereafter. Uh, so I would take any recommended changes, but um, I've heard that there are no changes recommended at this stage. I will say that we plan to beef up both the strategic plan and some of the SOPs around our third strategic objective, which is about knowledge transfer, because we think that there can be some significant um, procedures and mechanisms to improve the dissemination and implementation of uh, the evidence that we generate. And we think that's absolutely critical to having the impact that we see as critical. Uh, so the second chapter is about organizational structure. Um, keep in mind, this is a point in time and that point in time is now. Many people have asked if we should become a 501c3 and that may be important in the future. But if I look at say HCRN or uh, PCRN, neither of them function with that structure. And there's something about the lightweightness of not being a 501c3 that is uh, very, very valuable. Um, and so HCRN has functioned for over 10 years as a, with a gift account at Primary Children's as a way to take in money and a collaborative uh, structure functioning with a set of SOPs as a way to conduct itself. Um, but there are other things that are much larger, as many of the uh, quality improvement networks are that use take money in the form of a participation fee, and those very often form a 501c3 as a way to uh, you know, manage that aspect of the, the business of, of conducting quality improvement or a research network. Uh, so the, this chapter goes on to describe uh, the roles that sites might have, the site principal investigator, site all, uh, alternate investigator and the uh, research coordinator. Uh, I'll describe those roles in a, in a little bit. And then the data coordinating center, which is based at the University of Utah, where we have our DCC PI and we do a lot of our project management. Uh, Jacob Keen, who's on the call, is the DCC PI and does much of the project management. Uh, with my recent appointment to the University of Utah, that makes it um, 
much more easy for me to do some of the project management. So Jacob and I really split many of those uh, duties. We also have a you know a broad cadre of biostatisticians led by Susan Horn, our lead uh, statistician. Um, and then a number of other resources, including technical programming staff and data management and support staff that are key, like the technical programming staff is working today to work on the transfer of data and the spec for that and the mechanisms for that from, say, Nationwide Children's Hospital's EPIC extract to, uh, to the University of Utah for inclusion in the registry database. Um, and then that also has to take merges from the REDCap data that's being entered by the sites that are using REDCap. Um, so those are some of the resources there. Uh, I'll, I'm, in big, I'm in big trouble with myself. I'm going to have to go back and add that on in some way because I wanted a way for people to be able to capture this. Okay. Um, so those of you who are watching the recording, uh, you didn't miss much. We've covered organizational structure and network development. Uh, okay, so um, we've been leveraging a set of advisors um, to kind of that are available to call on things. It's mostly been like a, a kitchen cabinet for me. Um, they are listed on the website. Um, our discussion with the exec committee thought it would be really valuable to have that group get more formalized and sort of review our plans with them uh, on a semi-annual basis. Um, and so we've got, you see the list of people that are there now, Diane Damiano, who uh, most of you all know. Mike Dean heads the, the data coordinating center that runs PCARN and HCRN and seven other clinical research networks. Uh, Deb Hertz, many of you may know, she was spent like 20 years in the Office of Clinical Research at NINDS, has now retired from NINDS and is practicing neurology at UVM, but is still very available and helps us. Uh, and then John Kessel, who is uh, the, the chair of HCRN. Um, and then uh, we're looking to expand a little bit. Uh, with HCRN, we had the most involved NIH representative. Um, they have to recruit, recuse themselves from some discussions, but um, it's, it can be very useful to have. And then Amy suggested we get Peter Margulis, who's been very helpful whenever we've needed him, but to sort of formalize that. And so anybody have any thoughts about advisory board? People I think would be great to have that are sort of wouldn't be conflicted, but might have great views about the direction we're going and we think we should incorporate their perspective. The only thing I would suggest is most uh, other organizations have a parent or uh, lay person also on the board. Um, that's a that's a great idea. Um, you know, we have this committee, and we have Michelle and uh, Michelle and me are very uh, involved. Um, Michelle and I are very involved. I can't stand that, but anyway. Um, so, but it, but in this sort of advisory capacity, that would be a great idea to have a, a parent or and or a adult um, in this capacity. So, good good advice. Just a suggestion, because like I said, even, you know, the IRBs have to have a, a lay person, and most organizations have somebody who's very involved with CP, very passionate about it, a parent of a child, or even an adult with CP would probably be a good recommendation. Yeah, now, it is important to, to realize, that, like, we'll have to think about the roles of what we'll do, because we do have a whole, we have, like, 24 people that are in an advisory capacity that are both parents or, and or people living with CP, um, so I'll just have to give some thought as to whether or not, because this is advisory, they're not, they have no sort of voting or, or whatnot, and so um, I'll just have to give some thought to that. So we do have a way that we get um, advice from that body uh, often, and it's a pretty big body, so, uh, but it's a fair re recommendation. Any other thoughts about potential advisors? One of the things that I, I uh, might look to is someone that was, has a long track record in CP research, but is like uh, retired, but but still dabbling in some ways. Um, that would always be a great, uh, great person to have. Okay. Any other thoughts? Okay. So moving on. Um, 
And so specific roles, I, I kind of jumped ahead and talked uh, a bit about this. Uh, chair role, which is uh, right now is, you know, what I'm doing, just kind of uh, all things CPRN and trying to keep them uh, moving. Um, uh, as I said, the site uh, PI has responsibility for that IRB, but very often that gets delegated to a, a, uh, a site coordinator or a clinical research assistant. Um, but really the key differentiator is the, is the voting, um, and the alternate is intended to be sort of the, the backup person, so there's another person that's very involved. The demands of CPRN and time are, are not insignificant, so it's great to have someone to share that load with. Um, and then um, some, but not all sites, will have a clinical research assistant. Um, a Amy raised the question as to whether or not this will be possible to do without a clinical research assistant. Um, but, uh, you know, I think it, it will function in different ways in different groups depending on their, your how the usage of the EMR goes. Gary, do you have somebody that, that supports you beyond the work that your whole clinical team does to get data in? Yeah, not, not really. We have uh, – Dr. Leonard lends us some, one of his clinical people to help with the IRB issues around the um, – uh, all the reliance agreements and that kind of stuff, but ju just as a site, we don't we don't need anybody for uh, data entry, and we uh, we use some amount of you know we'll bo borrow some biostatistical help from the research institute that kind of thing, but but no, not a not a formal research assistant. Right, um, and, and it will be interesting to see. Uh, Amy, I can hear you're going to chime in, but hold on one second. I think it'll be interesting okay. to see when we add the uh, the surgical forms and whatnot. Um, uh, you know, it'll be interesting, especially for you, Dr. Leonard, to see whether or not you feel the need to leverage uh, uh, Adrian or not in that in that process. But we'll see. Amy, you're, you're off mute, so I know you want to say something. Right. Very good. Um, yeah, so actually that was really what I was just going to say, Gary, was as we expand to include other disciplines and information collected from other disciplines, as well as, um, you know, making sure the data is correct and if data is entered by two different disciplines, how will we check that? I think that we're going to need to really think about those things. Um, so I, I would be curious to see how, how you think that might work as we expand, Gary. So we'll just have to keep an eye on it. Yep. Yeah. Um, Jeff, from where you sit, do you think the, for the forms you've developed, I know you're not quite in test yet with them, do you have any opinions as to whether or not you're going to need, uh, like these are going to be within the scope of what you would sort of check off as a post-surgical note um, versus uh, requiring a clinical research assistant? Um, I guess I would take my, because I help with a lot of the HRN forms as well. I think they are short enough for the surgeons to be able to fill them out within the space of several minutes. And they should be able to take care of those in a real-time fashion. Uh, that's, the, that's the goal. So if that comes out, that'll be... Uh, That'll be awesome. Okay. Um, so uh, talk about DCC uh, um, PI and the roles Jacob plays and the role that Susan plays as our lead statistician. And then lastly, we have this community engagement director and uh, Michelle Schusterman, who heads up CP Now and, and is not often capable of finding the time to be on this call, but she is super engaged with our community and has just done a great job making sure that both for Research CP and for our Community Advisory Council, we've got a very uh, diverse um, set of people, you know, advising us and being available to help uh, where we want to do sort of the right level of patient engagement or community engagement for research. So any questions on roles? Um, so one of the key things uh, that is a, a role decision that we've had a lot of discussion about in the exec committee um, is how um, study PIs come into being. And so um, I have been kind of 
leading us down a path and, and uh, encouraged on many fronts to do something quite different from my experience with HCRN, where in HCRN, it's only the site PIs that, are, uh, that can be a PI for a study. There is a mechanism by which a more junior person um, or a person from sort of the outside of the neurosurgery practice can partner with the PI to get a study proposed, but it's, it's really very heavily focused on the site PIs. And so we have these multidiscipline teams. We've got only a capacity to have so many people in the sort of inner circle of being a site PI, but really CPRN is hoping to, you know, foment the most exciting uh, uh, research that can happen. And if it can come from outside of the site PI team and potentially outside of CPRN, we think that that's a good idea. So you'll see throughout the SOPs a mechanism by which uh, someone say, I'll use the example of Rich Stevenson, um, but how it would work down the road. Uh, Rich Stevenson as a developmental pediatrician at um, UVA would say work with Christopher Lunsford, who's the site PI, to say, hey, I've got this study idea and sort of really partner and have the site PI be the person that understands the inner workings of CPRN and kind of can mentor or guide even a, you know, a more senior person through the process of proposing a study um, and, and then potentially leading a study. And based on the last discussion with the uh, exec committee, we, we actually want to make sure that there's a mechanism by which someone who is not an investigator in CPRN can also do that. So they come and say, like, you know, if this is a, gr if this is a great idea and we review the concept, and I'll talk about the, the concept part as we get further along, um, but can really, you know, we've built this infrastructure, and while it, you know, this group will have the best, uh, be in the best position to propose studies to run through this infrastructure, we really want it to be leveraged for sort of advancing um, science and care around CP the most. And so, you know, the study PI then, um, once a study is approved, leads that study, and it's, you know, they may be invited to be a CPRN uh, site and investigator as a function of that, um, but that's really uh, kind of a, creates an entree for almost anyone. And so that was a key decision we wanted to get people's feedback on, uh, see if the, uh, the investigator committee had the same kind of uh, feelings of, of openness and encouragement of other study ideas uh, or if there were alternative opinions. So does anybody have any feedback, questions, comments on that? That sounds reasonable to me. Who's, whose voice was that? And that was Christopher Lundford. Okay, hi, Christopher. Great. Does anybody have any concerns about the concept? So, you know, uh, you know, stated in, in the sort of HCRN way, you know, HCRN, there's a lot of sense of the investment in getting the registry up and running is a lot of work, and so there is a, some concern about um, you know, someone coming in not having done the hard work but getting the sort of academic uh, opportunity and, and, and whatnot to leverage that hard work. Um, or do, does anybody have any concerns about this kind of level? Now, there, I'll describe the sort of bars and the, the hurdles and the, the process, but does anybody have any concerns fundamentally with the concept that um, – somebody outside of the, the PI team or somebody outside of the network overall might be able to propose a study that becomes a CPRN study. It sounds like the site PI being kind of the gatekeeper of some of the ideas helps to make sure that we as a group get to look at even some of those outside ideas um, more closely. And so that kind of get the best of both worlds, and we're not limited to just the ideas on this call, but we can still have the chance to, to try to help um, grow those ideas and still have them be still our ideas. Yep, and it's, it's actually stronger than that. The, the investigator committee will get to vote on a concept as to whether or yeah. not it gets developed to be a protocol or an application, and so it's you guys really, you all become gatekeepers of the, the science we pursue. Yeah. I agree with uh, that. And I, another thing. Sorry, go on. Go ahead, no, go ahead. 
Well, I was going to say we have a lot of uh, databases where we have med students and residents that come in and do various queries and all that. And just one other qualifier is that any time they publish any research or whatever, they have to give full credit to the institution and to the people who provided the data and supported that. So that's something we need to make sure we do when we do open this to outside people. Yeah, and you'll see there are, the SOPs have details on sort of the gatekeeping on uh, ancillary studies um, from, you know, the, from the registry and how other people would be approved. So this is, that's all considered, although it may, we, you know, we may have missed sort of opportunities there. But um, anyway. Other comments, concerns, thoughts? Okay. Um, I'm going to move on to site categories. Some of this is not um, fully developed yet, as you'll read from a governance perspective. But in talking about it, um, you know, we've always said from the beginning that we intend for uh, CPRN to conduct both clinical research and quality improvement just as two different mechanisms to achieve outcomes. Um, and so uh, when we look at sort of research networks versus quality networks, quality networks very often can attain a very different scale because the level of involvement is, um, it, it can be similar, but they're, um, they're, you know, they're potentially capturing a subset of registry kinds of data. Um, and they're focused on a sort of a, a protocol bundle, whereas the um, the research efforts can be a more can very often be a more all-consuming or just different consuming, such that you could envision an environment where you have research sites, quality sites, and research and quality sites. So, done some definition of this. I I think um, when we start to down the road look at sort of business models for scaling, um, many of the, most of the quality networks have a participation fee um, associated with them, and that is something we'll, have, we'll seriously consider as a way to sort of fund the infrastructure that supports them. But it also becomes an incredible mechanism for implementation and measuring implementation uh, and outcomes. And so, so anyway, so that's kind of a placeholder, but I just wanted to put it out there and see if anybody had any thoughts about uh, site categories. Um, okay. Um, I'm going to move on to, uh, so adding investigators and sites, this, this is an amazingly, it has turned out to be an amazingly important discussion in uh, in HCRN, and so, um, so what I've said is that the, at the high level, adding a site is an executive committee uh, decision. There's language about, um, you know, the whys and wherefores uh, that we would consider it, but it's, you know, basically comes down to adding value uh, to the network and believing there's capacity to, to successfully add a site without detracting from the existing work. Um, uh, it's very similar for adding investigators, but, you know, I will say that this is one of the things we've had to manage, um, you know, from the get-go of sites wanting to have multiple people as sort of site PI. And what, what we've done is for the founding sites, we've, we've offered that they can have, uh, have both two, two PIs, basically, because there's someone who is very involved in the running of the executive committee and the network overall and someone who's uh, involved, uh, you know, in the site and potentially a, a specific discipline within uh, CP. And so the, a number of our founding sites have two investigators uh, involved. Um, we expect that we will see requests for additional um, uh, sites and investigators throughout. You know, we, we certainly are being hit up on a regular basis about can, our, can my site join and the current state of that to all of the organizations that have asked us that over time is uh, kind of the model of what Phoenix did. Um, and so what, I, what I've been saying to people is go, do, go grab the IRB protocol and get an, an IRB approval. And if you get an approval, and we'll handhold along the way, and you, you're in. And so far, you know, Phoenix is the only one that's, uh, that's you know, successfully executed on that. But I do believe there are others seriously considering it. Um, 
but I think that the desire to appear in and the work to be in are, can be a fundamental dividing line. Um, so other ways that we enhance are, as I said, if we add a study where the PI is from outside the network, um, and then also when site PIs leave and how we replace. And so we've already had an example of that where Aga Luel, who is, uh, a, was the PI in Jacksonville, had to uh, leave Jacksonville for some uh, personal reasons. And uh, Dr. Christine Thurgood, has, uh, who was the alternate, has stepped up to be the site PI. Um, Christine, I don't know if you've appointed an alternate PI, but that's just a bit of uh, governance that we need to do. Um, yeah. Yes, it's uh, myself and Dr. Spear. Okay, I do have that. I, I think I have that noted. I'm just not remembering um, on it. Um, and then we typically, anytime we add, we're going to kind of add with this concept of a, prob a probationary period. And that's again, comes to the fact that so many sites want to do this, but the work, as you all know, to actually do it is not insignificant. And so, you know, it's that road to hell is paved with good intention. And so, we kind of leave open open the option to say um, we we appreciate your intention, but unfortunately you, you haven't been able to execute, and we're going to save this slot for another another site. Uh, and then there's lots of um, lots of details in the SOPs about what happens when a PI leaves. Um, this has been in HCRN the primary way in which new sites have been created because the PI will leave, they'll get startup funding at a new site, and but they go through a standard approval process for a new site of having to uh, kind of get on board with the registry, get on board with a, a quality initiative uh, before they are um, beyond, you know, outside of a probationary period. Uh, so those are some details about adding sites and investigators, lots more details in the actual document. Does anybody have any questions about that? Okay. But the other thing that the, there are details about is that the, like a lead, uh, a study PI that leaves actually gets to, to continue to run the study, um, potentially adding their site, but even if they're not adding their site. Okay, another important topic is site non-performance, which we kind of define as a substantial shortfall in CPRN activities uh, that range from things like, uh, you know, attending investigator meetings, but there's lots of action items and it's really about doing the work, the network and, you know, are we getting it done or following up and um, in general we want to uh, pursue the, the carrot approach and not the stick approach. So um, basically sort of highlight the organizations that are doing a great job and not, you know, shine the, shine the um, light of shame on the sites that are not getting it done, but we do need to maintain a mechanism uh, by which we can say, look, th this doesn't seem to be working, and we can kind of give you a, a warning, let you know what we're concerned about, what we're seeing, give you a chance to cure that. If not, actually develop a, an actual probation uh, that has a period and a set of cures that, that you would participate in and then revisit at the end of that period sort of as a way to formalize saying the site was a site, is no longer a site, or this PI was a PI, is no longer a um, a PI. So any questions about site non-performance? Okay. Um, so committee structures, and I think this will probably be all we'll get to uh, today, and then in two weeks uh, we'll take up the how these committees function, but we'll, we'll see. So um, currently we've got to find three standing committees, the uh, executive committee, and I'll go into the sort of roles and, and people, um, if you're not familiar, the investigator committee and the community advisory uh, committee are the three sort of standing bodies. And then we have subcommittees, and this is where I was saying I would hope that this uh, set of uh, discussions of our SOPs might get you thinking about where you might contribute. Uh, we have a research steering subcommittee, which is basically the ultimate approver of uh, which studies that we do do, um, but not the opening gate. And uh, we'll talk about that when we get to the, the research concept and uh, development um, phase. We have a scientific review subcommittee, um, which is kind of like a study section. And then we have a manuscript review subcommittee. 
which I really wanted something that could turn into a word, so I added the A from manuscript, and it's the Mars Committee. <laughs> um, and, uh, and in the future, we plan to add a dissemination and implementation subcommittee, because as we've said, that this is an area of the third strategic objective that we think is absolutely critical to making the work that we do be meaningful and impactful. Um, and there's some great uh, work that Jacob's been driving there, and so we'll have some some future details on that, but we think that's uh, critical. Um, and then there are a number of sort of ad hoc task forces, like I would describe all the, the groups that define their the um, common data model for, say, orthopedics or neurosurgery or non-surgical. Um, those were all sort of ad hoc task forces that we brought together. Um, and then we have study groups, and we've got, oh, like four or five study groups going now we've got an adult study group, we've got a pediatric uh, patient report outcome study group, um, we've got a QI study group that's um, forming, um, uh, we've got sort of the registry study group, which is really effectively at this stage the, the exec committee. Um, so um, there's lots of different things moving on, on this front. So I'm going to go into some details on these at the, at the standing level. Does anybody have any questions? Okay, um, so the goal of the executive committee is to sort of set the direction for the network um, and you know, sort of lead m much of the sort of uh, high level operational work um, for that. Uh, and this group creates the SOPs. Um, and the key things that we decide on uh, by voting are our financial oversight, um, study concepts, so the idea will be that a study concept before it gets to the, uh, the investigator committee for a vote, it's just, you know, whether or not it fits with the direction of CPRN broadly is going to be a thing that the, the executive committee will just be a place that people say, um, we will just say, yeah, we should, you should develop that into a full thing and, and let's have the investigator committee uh, consider it. Um, more details on that when we get into that chapter four review. Um, study pro protocols and applications. So this is another thing where if you've you know read ahead, when once we get something that's fully developed, uh, the executive committee in, in combination with some members of the advisory committee will approve it to say, yes, let's actually submit this and do it. Um, Network expansion, as we've already talked about, and then dispute adjudication for any of our subcommittees and PIs working with committees, and there are you know, challenges there. Um, this group currently meets uh, on an as-needed basis. It, it has ranged from biweekly to um, to quarterly. Um, it's got it will probably get on a more regular monthly pulse uh, following um, the completion of these SOPs. And uh, today, the membership is really selected uh, by, by me as a group discussion. Uh, and we're, we've decided that we're going to set terms of, of three years. We have not said anything about term limits at this stage. But that's, those are the major uh, sort of, uh, roles of the executive committee. Any questions about that? OK. Uh, the investigator committee, which is where most of you sit, is uh, the goal is to really generate and manage the studies, the publications, and the presentations that are uh, CPRN. Um, the vote that I talked about that, that stays with the site PI is on study uh, concepts after we, uh, after the executive committee just says, yes, this is worthy of being put in front of the uh, investigator committee. Uh, and that's also true of manuscripts uh, um, and um, well, studies and applications actually come out of the uh, out of the concept. So, kind of the gatekeeper there. Um, we're currently set up to meet two times a month uh, by telephone. We do that uh, on an as needed or uh, certainly at least once a month. Um, I would love for us to be able to do more face to face meetings and for more than the hour that we got at AACPDM. Um, love to hear um, thoughts about people's ability um, to 
make time for that, uh, we could certainly sort of fund some infrastructure, but we're not funded at a level to the, uh, today to say we could have a, a meeting um, of all of you in, you know, Chicago in March, which might be a sort of a, might make a lot of sense. Um, but my experience with the research CP is many of you are in a position from within your uh, departmental work to be able to, you know, come to a meeting. And so I'd love to get any feedback from that as to whether or not people feel like they could support going to a, a, a like an all day meeting, um, you know, once a year or something on their own uh, departmental funding that would be uh, would give us an opportunity I think would be very important as we start to get further down into defining studies and whatnot I think that kind of face-to-face -face time is going to be absolutely critical to the development of the network um, and then lastly you're the pool to draw from participation in the subcommittees that uh, I talked about a, a moment ago and I'll go into more detail uh, over time so any comments about the role of the investigator committee the any surprises questions comments Oh, I love a call that's got 20 people on it. Um, okay, so the Community Advisory Committee is led by Michelle. As I said, it's got broad representation. If you want to see who's on it, you can go to uh, uh, CPRN.org. Um, by the way, if I haven't communicated this, the the Canadian the the folks at uh, Carleton University, the Canadian Research Policy no Canadian Policy Research Network CPRN. Owners of CPRN.org gave us CPRN.org, um, so I appealed to them. They were they were closing down their operation, and it took a, a year to get it. But uh, we will eventually be converting our URL to CPRN.org. So yeah, I was excited about that. Um, anyway, so this uh, if you go to our site, you'll see under About Us, there's the community advisory people, uh, and you can read about any of them, but we've got about 25 people that have volunteered to sort of review our plans, participate in our um, study development, um, really good for helping with sort of PCORI-oriented studies, but many things for anything you want to do um, that is uh, patient-centered work. Um, so they're our pool to draw from for uh, that work and for our research steering subcommittee. Any questions on community advisory committee? Okay. Um, we have four minutes left and this is the, I've got the, um, I think I'll get through just one of these and then we'll get to the other subcommittees and the start to get into the meat of chapter four on the next call. So the scientific review subcommittee or SRS, you should think of as our own study section. So the goal, if you're thinking about whether or not you'd want to do this, if you've participated in study section before, awesome. If you're participating currently, awesome. Uh, the whole idea is you will receive a few, the volume of this is nowhere near like the commitment of doing an NIH study section. You will receive over time, you know, there might be two at once, there might be three at once, but there may only be one at a time. And so it's not scoring on a percentile cur curve, it's just sort of scoring for uh, really focused on scientific merit. Um, so we, we want a person very experienced with how study sections work to chair this. Um, and, um, you know, it's really will provide um, first a uh, a quality bar for um, uh, for uh, concepts that get developed into um, into protocols or applications, but then after they get approved, it will be playing a, a guidance role for uh, helping uh, CPRN and a, and a study PI develop a really good uh, concept, and they'll do that both with uh, some some dedicated members of the um, scientific review committee subcommittee and the members of the DCC. Um, it will be, uh, so studies will be scored and be given uh, feedback um, what, with summary statements very similar to uh, what gets done in an NIH study section. And uh, once again, there's a lot of detail about how this will all work and, you know, who will see those, those summary statements and how they'll be distributed and, and whatnot and how that will proceed towards an approval to uh, submit a, a study or, or a grant for um, to a funding agency. 
Um, so that's the Scientific Review Subcommittee. Any questions about that group? Okay. Uh, all right. So I think with two minutes left, I'm not going to try to dive into more committees. Um, I think we should be able to get through the rest of this on our next call. Um, but I greatly appreciate everyone's uh, time. Um, most of this has been recorded, and I will put it out for the for the rest of the people to uh, catch up on. But um, thanks. If you have any other questions or comments, feel free to send me uh, marked up SOPs or send me just comments and email. I'd greatly appreciate it. Paul, can you, you confirm the date and time for the next call, please? So the next the next call is the is the Tuesday of the third week um, of uh, of the month, which is the standing time. So let me take a look at the calendar to give you the exact time. It should be the oh, that's the wrong month. It should be the 20th of June. Yes, 20th of June at uh, at 2 p.m. Eastern, 11 a.m. Pacific, and then all the times in between. Okay. Yep. All right. Any other questions? All right. Thank you all very much. Look forward to talking to you in a few weeks. Thank you. Seeing uh, seeing a number of you in Chicago, actually. Bye bye.